History and Freedom by Theodore Adorno. This is Lecture 25, Consciousness and Impulse, February 16th, 1965. Ladies and gentlemen, you will perhaps recollect that last time I spoke in some detail about the experimenta crucis, the thought experiments being countered in connection with the question of freedom, and that this has led to two negative results. First, the inadequacy and lack of cogency in the conclusions reached by these experiments as such, particularly in the experiments conducted by Kant. And second, the problematic nature of this approach in general. Despite this, I believe that these experiments, and perhaps even more strongly the need to conduct such experiments, does lead somewhere. And in particular, it is led to what I referred to last time, or in the preceding lecture, as the additional factor, a term somewhat arbitrarily chosen, but one I feel comfortable with for that very reason. Sterile though these experiments may be, they do reveal one insight. This is that the decisions of the human subject do not simply glide along the surface of the chain of causality, but are pulled up short with a sort of jolt. I had already said as much to you, and even Bearden's ass, assuming that he finds himself faced with that rather luxurious choice, needs a bit of a jolt if he is not to starve to death. In the classical theory of freedom on the will, that is to say from Leibniz and Spinoza on, this additional factor is interpreted as the intervention of consciousness. Consciousness alone is supposed to make it possible to alter the direction of a causal sequence by adding extra motives. Kant's card sharp, for example, is motivated by his natural greed. Let us assume that despite everything, he happens to reflect on the moral law, or even more simply, because according to Kant, he does not even have to know the moral law, that he happens to recollect what he has been taught. In other words, always be faithful and true until you are in your cold grave. Perhaps our mythical card sharp will be swayed by this, to resist the causality of greed and to restrain the hand stretching out to seize the money. This may be true, although there is always a not entirely unfounded fear that any such change of mind may have been the product of reason. But in a quite different manner, our card sharp may well have said to himself that the risk of being caught was too great in this particular situation. Even so, there may be a grain of truth in this equation of the will with consciousness, and it would be a mistake simply to deny it in the interests of a purely voluntaristic theory of spontaneity. The way in which these two aspects are linked is something I hope to be able to explain to you in this lecture. Without consciousness, there can be no will that is evident, and no action that we could describe as an act of will could be an action without consciousness. In this connection, I would draw your attention to the way in which and this is an argument against the realm in which all these arguments take place, we are constantly forced to engage in the analysis of concepts, very much contre coeur in my own case, instead of being able to concentrate directly on matters of substance. Hence I had to tell you, and I could not have done otherwise, that when we speak of the will we necessarily speak of consciousness, and that in doing so we are concerned with phenomenology, with the analysis of meanings, Of course, these various meanings tell us nothing that is compelling about these complex matters of substance. At most, they tell us that if we wish to use the concept of the will, we cannot dispense with the concept of consciousness. I simply mention this in passing. The actual relationship between the analysis of meaning and the analysis of substance is not something we can pursue here. It belongs in a course of lectures on the theory of knowledge. Of course, such meanings always convey something of the underlying substance, so they are not to be despised, any more than they are to be made a fetish of. But I cannot go into this now. Unconscious action, an action in which consciousness does not intervene, of the sort we find on the part of the dying or very sick people or the mentally disabled, is purely a matter of reflexes. It cannot be distinguished from other natural processes. Our entire experience of freedom is tied up with consciousness. Whenever we know ourselves to be free agents, however misguided or problematic our actions may be, we confront our actions with the consciousness with which we act. 
in contrast to the series of motives that I referred to a few lectures ago as ego alien, a term taken from psychology, but which I would like to think of as metapsychological here. The human subject can know that he is free only when his actions seem to him to be identical with him as subject. That is the case only where his actions are mediated by his consciousness, are indeed essentially induced by his consciousness. This then is the legal justification of what might be called the rationalist theory of the will in the broadest sense, one that also includes Kant. But consciousness is not simply identical with free action. Consciousness is not simply to be equated with the will, as is the case in Kant, where ultimately the will is nothing but the capacity, or the quintessence of the capacity, to act as, as reason dictates. I believe that I can explain the distinction most easily, or, if you prefer, most vividly, with the aid of an illustration that is familiar to all of you, and that was formulated at the birth of the modern age. What I have in mind is what literary scholars tend to call the problem of Hamlet. You all know about how Hamlet, Prince Hamlet, is completely sane, but that he acts the madman in order to be able to avenge the murder of his father and to put the state of Denmark, in which something is rotten, again to rights. You all know, too, that this problem by no means exhausts the problem of Hamlet. The distinction between sanity and madness expresses itself in a further distinction that goes much deeper. The huge influence of this Shakespearean play and the fact that its relevance has endured over the centuries could not be adequately explained by the intrigue based on this act of dissembling. The real problem is that this man is incapable of performing an action that he believes to be right. This problem becomes entangled with the question of insanity because he finds himself cut off from reality in a way that really does possess structural similarities with madness. For it involves the same kind of withdrawal of libidinal energy from external reality that is one of the most typical symptoms of schizophrenia. You all remember this situation, this chasm that opens up between inner and outer. You all recall his words about the pale cast of thought. Thanks to which enterprises of great pitch and moment are sickly, sicklied or, or, over. That is the substance of Hamlet's famous monologue. Its content, however, is philosophical in nature, and its modernity is probably connected with the fact that Hamlet's inner conflict stands at the beginning of the age of the bourgeoisie and of rationalism, the age of reflection. Hamlet is an outstanding example of a reflective person and, as has been shown, knew his Montaigne inside and out. Thus, the chasm that is opened up between consciousness and action has to do with the philosophy of history, and it is connected with the gulf between inner and outer that must have come as a great shock at around this period, a shock that we can scarcely imagine, and that has been reflected in philosophy in the writings of Descartes, Shakespeare's near contemporary. Descartes drew a sharp distinction between the two substances, the inner thinking substance and the outer reality to which action belongs, and only by means of an artificial and superstitious contrivance was it able to explain the way in which one of these might impinge upon the other. This was the so-called this was the so-called influxus physicus, as he terms it. At the time when the medieval world refused fundamentally to recognize this gap between inner and outer, it was itself a self-contained totality. The individual did not see himself as an autonomous thinking being whose reason stood opposed to an external order. On the contrary, he regarded himself as an integral part of that order. It was in this sense that he felt at home in the world. Incidentally, this is also the basic motif of all backward-looking speculations about the Middle Ages, beginning with novelists' essay Christendom or Europe, and continuing down to our own day, with George Lucas's magnificent theory of the novel deserving particular mention. It should be noted, however, and I cannot speak of these matters without pointing this out to you, that such writers failed to perceive the necessity for the demise of the medieval cosmos. This means that all these retrospective reflections have something romantic and untrue about them, because these writers were so enamored of the idea of a unified culture, something Hegel called substantiality, an idea that plays a central role throughout his writings that he developed on the model of the Greeks, 
These writings, I say, were romantic and untrue because their authors were so enamored of this unified quality or substantiality that the question of the truth or untruth of the transcendental reference points, of the spiritual reference points on which such an order rested, never even arose. Such writers then go on to declare that what is genuinely or supposedly beneficial for mankind, namely what Mr. Bolnau would call the sheltered nature, of such a constitution is to be made the index very, regardless of whether the state of our knowledge has undermined the assumptions of such a medieval cosmos. We might almost go so far as to criticize romanticism by pointing out that it is profoundly pra pragma pragmatist in its assumptions, in other words, the very opposite of what it believes itself to be. By this I mean that romantic thinkers infer the legitimacy of a spiritual order from the effect that it has without paying attention to its truth or untruth. Incidentally, this development, which was magnificently codified for the first time in Hamlet and Descartes, has a long prehistory in medieval nominalism. The only difference is that just as Hegel represents it as resembling the petals that still lie concealed beneath their protective sepals, so too do these rational reflections begin by remaining within this medieval ordo, only to burst forth suddenly at the time of the Reformation and transform reality at a stroke. <clears throat> this change brought about by processes within the philosophy of history meant that, as a knowing rational being, the conscious human subject withdraws his actions from the realm of the irrational, corrupt, bad reality confronting him. But it also means that the entire relation of the individual to this reality becomes problematic. Wherever the subject wishes to move to action, he finds himself in the grip of a horror vacui, unsure about how he will ever succeed in emerging from his own rationality so as to transform into reality what he has perceived to be rational and what actually constitutes the substance of a reflecting subjectivity. For the fact is that this reality whose meaning has been sucked out of it and has become wholly concentrated in the human subject itself no longer provides the basis for an intervention and indeed has become so radically alien and opposed to the human subject that the latter prevaricates while attempting the simplest task in finding himself unable to cope. Thus, in a philosophical sense, Hamlet's feigned madness is also his true madness, one of the most inspired creative acts in the history of art, but in all likelihood one that was only possible, like the later instance of Don Quixote, because its author was unaware of the philosophical background, but simply codified the experiences that were triggered by the underlying shock. If you think back to the plot of Hamlet, and I assume that you all have a thorough knowledge of the play, one fact will perhaps have struck you. This is that at the end, in the final scene, events, and here this means the most horrific killings, suddenly crowd in on us in a way reminiscent of puppets on a string. Up to now, Hamlet, whose thoughts have prevented him from carrying out the deed, that allows from his thought that follows from his thoughts, and he was not succeeded in breaking the spell of thinking and escaping from his monologue, his monologue interior, as we might put it nowadays, has suddenly, and I would add irrationally, in a manner that leads directly to his own death, gone on a killing spree and has stabbed everyone who crosses his path. I believe that it is easy for us to criticize the improbability of these circumstances in which events, poison and daggers, seem to conspire together and bring about a conclusion that could not be attained by the conscious human will. But, as always with the supreme works of art, it pays to reflect a little on what this denouement really means. For unless you want to reduce works or art to a sort of fetish, to plaster busts standing around in some museum or other, it is not enough for us to declare ourselves satisfied with the vague effect they have on us. We should instead try to discover the underlying reason for this effect. In the case of Hamlet, I would suggest that, that what I have called the additional factor, and I hope that you will forgive me for this term, makes its appearance in the play, both inwardly and on the surface, in just as striking a manner as in the case of the rupture between inner and outer in the history of philosophy. The situation is that Hamlet has, rightly or wrongly, 
felt himself to be under an obligation to obtain revenge. This obligation itself is a relic from the Middle Ages, from feudalism, rather than a rational duty, but you can see from this too how the two epochs stand on a knife's edge in the play. Once he has felt this obligation, he can only succeed in carrying out his intention with the aid of a sudden violent impulse that in the play stems from the fact that he himself has been wounded. And the prince's action at this point seems to be unconnected with the complex, elaborate and rational reflections that have preoccupied him throughout the drama hitherto. The additional factor, that is to say the element in his taking action that goes beyond rationality, can be studied here as in a test tube, and it is probably only the convention, a convention implanted in us for centuries, that compels us to measure this factor, without which there could be no action, against the yardstick of rationality. This explains why we tend to think that these final events are somehow puppet-like or ridiculous, since we fail to notice that what is happening is, is that this additional spontaneous factor, or what we might even call this irrational element, forces its way to the surface. I do not believe that I am likely to stand accused of lending support to any irrationalist theory of the will, in the spirit, say, of Carl Schmidt, or even of Max Weber, but I do believe that, if you think seriously about these matters, you should not let yourselves be put off by the traces of such an idea, and that you should try to, to the best of your ability, to see these things just as they are, in all their complexity. This factor, which I have called the additional or the irrational factor, survives as if it were the indestructible phase in which the separation between inner and outer had not yet been consolidated. If I can express it again in the context of, of the philosophy of history, I would say that, for Hamlet to be able to put into practice the moral and political ideas he has formed, he must perforce regress. He must return to an earlier archaic stage, the stage of an immediate expression, that is to say of hitting out something we are familiar with from our dreams, where it happens often enough that we only need to conceive a hearty dislike for someone for us to feel like killing him in our dreams. Perhaps you are not wicked enough for that, but I at any rate have frequently experienced such things and always felt a little disappointed when I woke up. Hamlet then must in a sense have acted in accordance with such such, with some such archaic desires in order to obtain his revenge. Revenge, for its part, is likewise an archaic phenomenon that is not really compatible with a rational bourgeois order of things. What is happening here, the factor that I should like to show you as being integral to the constitution of what we call will and freedom, is the factor that we refer to in pre-scientific discourse as spontaneous action, or psychologically perhaps as impulse, even though psychologists use the phrase impulsive characters to to describe people whose entire behavior is conditioned exclusively by this aspect of their psyche. This impulse is both somatic and mental at the same time, and in all probability these two aspects cannot be separated out entirely. This is because, as I have already told you, when we act on impulse we regress to a phase in which the separation between outer and inner is not as clear-cut, not as definitive as it is today. We might say that, setting aside its rational, modern, bourgeois, unified qualities, the will contains archaic features, to the point where we may legitimately ask whether something like the will is still possible today in a society that has become rationalized through and through. In the dialectic of enlightenment, Horkheimer and I wrote at one point, in connection with the problems of the culture industry, that in the framework of total planning characteristic of the culture industry, Human beings regress to the reactions of amphibians. We might say that once this archaic aspect of the will has been entirely ousted by planning and rationality, it paradoxically provokes a regressive reaction on the part of human beings. It means that they are no longer capable of will, impulse, or spontaneity, but that they increasingly behave like guinea pigs about to be subjected to vivisection. It is my belief that in our society there are countless symptoms of the most terrible kind that amount to the sort of regression I have in mind, from the concentration camps that deprive people of their willpower down to certain methods of treating mental illnesses, so-called shock treatment. In a radically administered world, 
that is to say, in a world which, as I hope I have described it to you in the first part of these lectures, really had fallen under the thumb of universal, undialectically and exclusively, the will would lose all its power. It would be supplanted by human reflex actions. In other words, by that dreadful realm that was first established by Pavlov's experiments. I have told you that the impulse of which I have been speaking is the same as the will, and that its existence is the strongest and most immediate proof that there is such a thing as freedom. It is neither blind nature nor suppressed nature. It is quite possible that this impulse was originally a kind of reflex too. In that case, it was only through the participation of consciousness, in actions that were originally blind and reflexive, in nature that this additional factor that I regard as a constitutive element of the will came into being. I can imagine that many of you who have been, how who have not been trained, or dis, who oh fuck, or are disinclined to think dialectically, will want to object at this point. You will want to tell me that I am appealing to an element that is supposed to be absolutely crucial for the constitution of freedom, and at the same time, if I trace the genesis, the origins of this element back to its ultimate roots. I find myself back at something that has been determined by blind nature. It is my belief that this objection, which I have raised on your behalf, brings us to a point that is of crucial importance for philosophical thought as such. It seems to me that what one has to learn in order to gain access to dialectics, I am not speaking here of the educational background and the, and the technical knowledge required, is this. You need to free yourselves completely and utterly from the idea that everything that has ever existed is able to preserve itself in a form identical with what it once was. It is possible and may even be the decisive factor that enabled human beings to emerge. It is possible, I say, for something age old to survive and nevertheless to become radically different from what it originally was. In order to, in order to illustrate this, I usually refer to an example from the world of aesthetics. The same music that has achieved such heights in Viennese classicism, classicism arose from the society of the absolutist courts and their need for entertainment. If the members of the aristocracy had, had had no need to amuse themselves, to kill time, such music would not have come into being. The innermost essence of this music is to compress temporal extension to a single point, so that a lengthy elaboration sounds as if it had lasted no more than a moment. What I say is that, but for society's heteronomous need, a need quite external to art, a need that took the form of asserting, just, just make sure that we don't get bored, we should probably never have progressed to the style of the quartets of Haydn and Mozart, and ultimately Beethoven's last quartets. Incidentally, these quartets will be the subject of a lecture tomorrow in the music department given by my young friend, Rudolf Steven. If you look at works of this kind, you will see that despite their origins and despite the fact that something of the experience of time, characteristic of the divertisement, is preserved in them, they no longer have anything in common with the heteronomous phenomena that you will find in lesser products, such as the um, Gebro Gebrush music of Viennese classicism or cla sorry classicism 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 I, whatever of course it is very risky applying such arguments in such a speculative context particularly where the subject matter is so well known however plausible they may have seemed in historical terms but I would like to say that something that begins as a reflex often tends to make itself autonomous. And this is probably connected with the, with the withdrawal of the subject from the world and the corresponding strengthening of the ego. This has the consequence that the reflection of the modern subject in its newfound strength falls upon what seems at first sight to be the ego alien element of impulsive action. And that this action likewise turns into an impulse that is more powerful and different in a certain sense than what the subject had intended vis-a-vis -vis the object, but is nevertheless determined by the subject's desire for autonomy. We might even say, to put it crudely, that the reflex reaction ends up in the service of the ego principle. Genetically speaking, this is not actually as outlandish as it may seem, 
because the ego itself consists of libidinous energy that is split off and turned to the testing out of reality. In other words, the ego is not absolutely alien to this additional factor, this impulse that I've been talking about. With this impulsiveness, freedom extends into the realm of experience. If we behave spontaneously, we are no more simply blind nature than we are suppressed nature. We feel that we are ourselves, but at the same time, we feel we have been released from the spiritual prison of mere consciousness, and this impulse enables us to enter, to take a leap, call it what, we, what you will, into the realm of objects that is normally barred to us by our own rationality. It is extremely hard for us to find the right expressions with which to describe these very profound matters without instantly reifying them. The irresistibility of impulses that we observe in ourselves, or at any rate that I observe in myself, and that I am sure you will perhaps also notice once you have trained yourselves to observe yourselves, is perhaps connected with the fact that in yielding to impulse we find that what I have called the Hamlet syndrome has for a moment been overcome. The sense of being divided, of being between inner and outer, is overcome as in a flash. Thus we believe that as long as we obey our impulses, we shall find ourselves once again in the realm of objects, from which we had withdrawn by an absolute necessity, albeit perhaps only in appearance. Thus the phantasm of freedom may be said to be something like a reconciliation of spirit, the union of reason and nature as it survives in this impulse. If I have represented the will or the acts of the will in a peculiarly dualistic way that will appear to many of you as over-mechanical and schematic, and I am well aware of the misunderstandings that can arise from an overly mechanical way of speaking, the fault lies with the way in which the utterances of freedom are tied to a reality full of contradictions. Moreover, these utterances themselves bear the stamp of those contradictions as I have described these two aspects. For, and with this commitment, I should like to bring this lecture to a close. You must not forget that both the elements that are, in, that are needed in freedom is to make its appearance. In other words, both reason and impulse are mutually interdependent. Thus, practice, including political practice, calls for theoretical consciousness at its most advanced. And, on the other hand, it needs the corporal element, the very thing that cannot be fully identified with reason.